Welcome back to The Inner. Today I have with me Jeff Domanski. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. What's up, Nelson? How have you been? Oh, I've been good. Full. <laughs> Life is full. A lot going on, a lot of activities, family, work, fun play. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. So if you could introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Uh, so my name is Jeff Domanski. And I am a uh, founder and owner of Sugula Studios, which is a graphic art music studio. And uh, fairly new. We've been around uh, officially for about a year and a half. The idea has been in my brain for much, much longer. But uh, have been dreaming about it for a long time and finally got feet on the ground last year, get it off the ground and um, really excited about what we're doing. When I say we, it's really my wife and I. And uh, right now, and a couple friends who are pro bonoing it for me on different uh, needs, but uh, we're real excited. And uh, like I said, I do graphic art and and music, and uh, we have uh, a branch of our music that's focused on subliminal messaging and and subliminal music. And we're really excited about uh, getting that part. It's called Loaded Music, and uh, uh, we launched it this year as a kind of a way to get into the health and wellness sector um, and branch out beyond just the arts and entertainment. But uh, I've been doing music all my life um, since I was a little wee one and I have a degree in music. I went to Azusa Pacific University and that was, man, that's years ago, 97, I graduated from university. I'm 48 right now. I have a wife two, and four kids, all boys, ages, uh, what is he now? Um, almost four, almost five, excuse me, in January up to 14. So we have a, a tiny home full of energy and life, and uh, it's never a dull moment, uh, as you can imagine. And we live in Idaho. I know I'm kind of shooting around here with different thoughts in my brain. I was like, introduce yourself. Well, let's start here. No, I'm kind of rabbit trail on things. So I apologize for that. But yeah, we live in Idaho You're doing good. Um, in the panhandle way up north and we've been living in this state uh since 2013 so i think officially it's and i moved around a lot so officially this has been the longest place we've we've lived as a family and uh, we love it here call it home we have five acres on a mountain and we burn burn wood and we enjoy the snow in the winter time which we're getting ready to have some more here um so it's it's been good a uh, good part of the journey life here has been different we've Purposely chose to live out about the countryside to mitigate some of the uh, the the things that tingle us up from diving into the deep things of, of our father and going after those things, um, removing conveniences, making it a little more challenging, making it more purposeful in how we live. It's been good. Um, it hasn't been easy, but that's been a choice we made early early in um, our lives. And just kind of follow through as a family. But we've loved it up in Idaho. Um, and uh, chasing after God. As a matter of fact, we moved here. One of our, our basic, our, our desires was to say, you know, we're going to uh, love God, raise my kids, and raise my food. Um, the first two have done really well. The second part has taken a little longer to get going. But uh, we, we still have dreams of having a huge garden to, to live off of. Um, you know, bulk of our food, but yeah. Uh, so I work full time right now. I have, as I mentioned, I have the business, but I also work full time in a school district in the IT department, and been doing that for many, many years now. Since we, well, since we moved here, um, and so in that strange transition of trying to move from being employed to being an employee or employer, right? A self, a, a, a business owner. And, and trying to move into that full time, um, it's it's like having two feet and a foot in two different canoes. And sometimes they really spread out. It's it's uncomfortable trying to to move one foot, both feet into the, the full time business canoes. Been a little challenging. This year I was hoping to do that. It didn't work out. But um, I know the father's heart plan for this is to go long term. You know, it's a marathon race. So just keep at it. And uh Again, loving God, loving my kids is the primary, and then everything else falls after that. But yeah, that's, that's cool. kind of the nutshell in the 
in the immediate sense and future of our lives right now. That's great. So um, if you could kind of narrate for us, how did your journey with God begin and how did you end up where you are now? Sure. So uh, like I said, I've been in music all my life and also been well, in the church uh, as a child all my life, as, as a child, as an adolescent teenager, um, and uh, love God wholeheartedly and and the way I knew how to, right, in the church of wineskin. I, and I knew how to do the right things and, and worship. I always had an intimate connection with him. I didn't have the full paradigm, the full revelation that I have now. I only knew what was was programmed, you know, in the church doctrine and theology and education that I got, which I don't begrudge. Um, it was cookie. Cr- it was cookie crumbs to to find and discover the real relationship that I have today, and I'm still growing in. Um, but I grew up in the church, and music became just it was my mom and dad's passion and. It, it, genealogy uh, in the generations, you know, my grandparents as well um, did something with music in the church in some degree of form or fashion. And so I kind of followed in that step. As a matter of fact, I even went the next step and got a degree in music, as I said earlier, and with the pursuit of going into full-time ministry, you know, what, what do you do as a, a young man growing up in church, you know, and, your life is centered around it. You do ministry. You go after degree. You go after the license, whatever it is that you know to go after to become full time ministry and and minister for the Lord in His house. So I went and got a degree in music with the intention of becoming a music pastor. You know, I, I grew up in California, born and raised in the Bay Area, and so I had that uh, middle income mindset. So. You know, the, the, the dream was, and it seems so crazy to think about it now, the dream was to become a music pastor, be married, have 2.5 kids and a dog living in suburbia, California somewhere. That was, for whatever reason, was the dream to chase after. And I think that's partly because, you know, similarly follow the footpaths of my own parents. And so, you know, you follow what was modeled for you. And so that that kind of was the the, the marker that I was chasing after right up until about 90, 97, uh, when uh, the church that I was attending or it was my, my family was attending for many, many years, um, stepped into new re- renewal, um, the Brownville revival, Brownsville revival, and then the revival out of uh, Toronto, the Toronto blessing, right? Call those back in the 90s. Woo, maybe maybe some of your audience don't even know what I'm talking about. That's fine. A long time ago, there was another movement, another revival and outpouring, and and it was influential in my church and influential in my life. And it actually um, railroaded or derailed my dreams and my my thoughts and desires for my life early early on. Um, I had all things planned out, and and Father shows up, Holy Spirit showed up, and it was everything went out the window. And began this long journey of unpacking, unraveling, uh, reverse engineering the dream, and and discovering that the dream I had was nuanced, but it wasn't the real thing. It wasn't what he had written and designed for me. But I didn't know it. I didn't know the language. I didn't have the the grid work for it. And so I had to unpack everything else. And and eventually, you know, let go of it all, put it all on the side of the road, and say, hey, you know, in a cardboard box, and I'm driving down this pathway with a yes in my heart, but I, I feel crazy about it. But this is, I've seen the honey inside the honeycomb, and I can't go back. And so, begin a journey in the 90s, in late 90s, into the 2000s. Uh, I started to do move around, still single. Um, I went to International House of Prayer and was involved with that community for several years and that got some of that DNA and a little more opened up as the father's heart, understanding the father and his heart, not just the new, but in the old Testament and beginning to digest that and make it part of myself. Um, again, building pieces, building blocks to a, a greater understanding. Um, and then in that time I met my wife, Jessica, 
in Kansas City, and we began the journey together. And we we headed down roads we never expected. Our parents didn't expect um, becoming uh, chasing after something because we didn't like what we had. It, it just didn't. It was it was tasteless. It just like we both grew up in the church. We did all the programs and the functions and everything. We did all of the steps. You name it. We did some form of function of it. Um, ministries of every shape and size, even the new wineskin, even new ministries um, we were involved with and yet it was missing something it was it, and today i know you know the the key ingredient was this relational dynamic with our father that was missing in that whole journey it was still performance mindset it, it still was servant mindset we were we were sons and daughters acting like servants in our father's house and we didn't have a wineskin to understand that because everything that we had seen and experienced was was in his name but it wasn't in in the name as a son you know and so i had to unpack all that we had to together we we went on our quote unquote dark night of the soul um for many many years we moved to new york to where her parents are at her parents were our were pastors our pastors worked in their church as well and eventually, after a few years there, we said, we got to step out. We got to get out of the of this wineskin, this four walls organization. We got to go do church organic. That is the word we had, organic church. And just basically was this idea that we're going to do it in relationship. We're going to rediscover what it means to break bread with our brothers and sisters of our father's house in Christ and do relationship first to get that that working let's put the function aside right because the function's been making us stumble so let's rediscover what it means and it was it's difficult because there weren't a lot of people willing to do that didn't even know where to begin with us <laughs> so, you know we, we put our families and her family especially through a little bit of a, a hardship because of our decision because people were like what the heck what are they doing uh, why did they step out of the ministry? That why they leave the church? You know, did they fall? Did they backslide? But they they have marital problems, and and so you know they are, are my in laws, my parent, my my wife's parents had to foot a lot of that, and that was challenging for them. But we we couldn't turn back. It was the course that was calling us. It was the voice. It was the father's voice calling us, and. Um, after stepping out, and that was 2010-ish, 11, um, a few years later, we decided to up and move across the country again. Um, to We had moved to California for a while and then moved to New York. And then now we moved to Idaho, sold half our belongings, and and packed the rest up in a car, two kids, and drove to Idaho. Uh, sight and scene, uh, no place to land, no job, you know, no home. My father said, go. And so we did. And in his faithfulness and goodness, within a, f uh, a few months, we were we had all those those needs taken care of. And we began to, to replant in a new new field and go after relationship, not even having the full wineskin yet. You know, it was still I know this is the right direction. I haven't seen the city yet like Abraham. Right. Looking for a city way off. I, I know it when I land there, but I haven't. And I'm going to keep walking. And that's kind of what we felt like. We, we know we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be doing a relationship. We don't have a lot of people to do it with because they don't get it. They think that relationship has to be within the four walls, has to be done in structure, has to be done in function. Relationship comes second kind of thing. They wouldn't say that. Most people wouldn't say that, right? They'd say that uh, they, they balance out relationship and function. But the reality is when function fails, then relationships sever. And that's the first fruit right there saying, hey, obviously you don't understand relationship because when the function failed and you tried to fall back in relationship, there was nothing to fall back in. And all you could do is part ways. Yeah. Right. And that's people don't understand that in the church. They it's think like being I call around function, each other. Right. It's like being around each other once a week doesn't mean we ever got to know each other. Right. Right. This functional relationship. It means you had relationship in the function. But apart from that, there was no life. There was no life beyond it. You couldn't sustain any connection without that function. 
And and I think that's part of the struggle still in most churches today is they just don't know how to function in relationship apart from the function, how to maintain organic life, breaking bread, like in, you know, in, in the first, first years of the church, going from house to house. So, you know, that was we're like, we're done with the other function stuff. We want the relationship. And that, that was the big drive for us. And um, even being here now in Idaho for seven years now, 10, 10 years, 10 years. Yeah. Um, we've really happened on some relationships that, that are allowing us to experience that stuff. Albeit um, most of them are in online communities. I have a handful here in the, the region, but most of them are online because uh, it's still fairly uh, far and few in between, you know, as far as people having that shared light mindness is uh, desire for relationship and chasing at this wineskin, which has no label yet. I don't know if we'll ever find a label for it. We'll rock it in. It's so <laughs> mixture of things. Um, but we wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, we are more alive today than ever. Our, our hearts are more turned into the Father than ever before. And we have language even now to help us stay and continue to build, which is huge. And um, I love I love the sonship uh, factor that we have stepped into. It set up so much freedom. Um, I, I finally get to feel like I understand Christ now as a, as a brother, right? As a son of Yahweh, because now I can be one. I think that's part of the problem. People don't understand that they are sons and daughters, but they don't know that you have what is Christ? The first son of many, right? The firstborn of many sons. Well, that means you're a son. That means I'm a son. That means we get to operate as sons alongside our older brother, which yeah. means I can call him brother and not feel like I am diminishing his quality or glory. And what it does is actually draws, draws me up higher and become more like him. So those are the things that are swirling around me and my family right now. And part of our dialogue, our daily bread and just discovering what it means to be children of our father's house. How do you live and act in his house among other brothers and sisters? How do you act alongside your older brother? Who's your greatest hero model? And that it's been fun discovering it. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you really get introduced to uh, Sonship? It's, oh yeah, it's been coming on slowly. I mean, you know, you get the words in your mind even earlier on before, you know, you read the scripture. How can you not see it in the scripture when you're reading it? You know, even if you're just, the language is there, maybe it's not yet in your heart. Um, so the seeds were planted years and years and years and years ago, building upon, building upon that over and over and over again. I think it got to the point um, a few years ago, maybe five years ago now, I've lost track of time when things have been introduced to this stuff. So 2017 was probably the first time that it was a aha moment. Um, it unlocked and I realized I, I knew it, but I didn't know it. I didn't believe it. And that's when I begin to believe. And I begin to question my the programming of the church for the, the sonship concept, but living in a steward. See, a lot of stuff today is this, even the realms, kingdom stuff, it, you have to think it just sounds like the church wineskin with new labeling and package. Hey, new brand new product. We just put new on it. And, and I think that's partly because of the desire to go into something new, but not having a revelation of relationship to step into it. And so the sonship aspect really, it, it was a crucible time. I, I mean, honestly, in order to come to a place of sonship, I had to let go of the things of what I understood to live and be a child of God. I had to be part of who he intended to me. and and. and start taking my own wineskin or my own uh, thought processes of what it should look like and, and toss them out. So I, it was a lot of crushing time, right? It was letting go of, of what I expected it was to be like and start really looking at how he has described me as a son. 
and what he intends for me as a son. So the identity was critical. I had to rediscover identity, really. Um, I had to come to a belief system. And that, I think that's part of it. A huge factor is I had to believe. And it seems so so simple because what is belief? Belief is the entrance to the kingdom. It is the, the gateway to the first love. And, and somewhere along the lines as we pursue spiritual things and pursue righteousness, right? Pursue our passions, pursue our destiny scrolls. We we kind of throw belief, like, oh, I got this now. I got the belief. I could, but we don't realize how much unbelief still resides in us. And so the little, little bit of yeast of unbelief is scattered throughout our life. In the language and the thought lights belie this as we if we really begin to observe what we say when we think we begin to really peel back the the reality of our own belief and it goes to the core and and so it's a journey of removing all the level of unbelief in who we are doing it in relationship with christ who is that that butcher knife he was 412 that goes in and pierces the inner being of our of our core the inner core of our being, begin to, to remove that and replace it with belief. Because, you know, in Hebrews, he says, you, you can't enter into the rest, uh, my rest, my Sabbath rest, without taking your faith and mixing it with belief, taking the word that you've heard. And, and so belief or unbelief is what keeps us most from accessing that stuff. And so he really had to deal with that unbelief deep down, still dealing with it. As I have, I, as I become a hunter in my life, and every thought, every word, every action, I look for that unbelief. And when I when I'm responding, and and when I see it, I try to slay it as much as possible, because I realize it hinders me from stepping into the fullness. And this is it's beyond just like, I know he loves me, you know. It's beyond, I have his acceptance. Now it's a, uh, I. No matter what I do, no matter what I say, I will not lose the acceptance and love and the great favor, right? Now it's like I desire to be the fullness of who I am. So I'm going to push into not just finding acceptance and love. That's an immutable thing now. Now it's you want you want me to step in the fullness of who I am. So I'm going to put a big yes in here. And that's going to be my thing. I'm going to be loyal to that. And I'll do my my 1% yes, because I know I'm going to need your 99% to get me over that next place. And so that's kind of the positioning, removing the unbelief, keeping a yes, and getting pressed into to the reality of who I am as a son. Um, and it's been exciting. It's been absolutely exciting and freeing to live without the fetters of the world systems and programs and thought lives and and my one of my favorite questions is just why why do i have to think that why do i have to do that i'm not a, i'm not a servant in his house i'm a son i don't have to do those things these are not things that the son has to do if my father if my elder brother doesn't do it then why should i bother with them and and so it's removing the should have could have would have as well and, and really settling back into identity. I'm a son first. As I be a son, as I am a son and act as a son, the, the outflows, the fruits of the spirit, all, the, all those different outflows will come as a byproduct of just being a son first and foremost. And it's, it's, been, it's taken the performance mindset coming from a music background, you know, performance, performance, performance. And, and putting that off, say, I don't have to perform anymore. You can't, you can't perform as a son. You are a son. There's no way for you to do anything other than just be. I cannot stop being my father's son. You know, speaking of the natural. He is my father. I'm his son. There's nothing I can do. He could disown me, I suppose, but that won't genetically change me. I am a son. Of my father and likewise my heavenly father so there's nothing i can do to change that so i step into being and out of the being 
becomes the performance, the outflow. And that's really what Christ was doing, right? When he was walking on the earth, he wasn't going about doing signs of wonder because he wanted to do them. He did. But the reality was, is he was being a son. I only, I only do what my father's doing. I only say what my father's saying. So I'm, I'm just being a son. And out of the relationship I have on a daily basis, this is the stuff that flows out of me. And I want you to come into the same with me because our father desires you to come into the family. Join us. Be one with us. John 17. I want the same union that he and I have. I want you to have the same. And so I'm going to show you how to do it as a son. And he opened that, cracked open that door again. So mm -hmm. we're going after it. We're choosing to say yes. You know, everything else goes out the side. <laughs> Whatever comes back, it's it's up to him. But for now, I am going to sit and be a son and learn what it means to live in that position, beloved position. Yeah. And you you've been saying something that I just want to agree with is the saying yes part. <laughs> like people have often asked me how I was able to stay as dedicated as I was to my walk and to my journey. And it's because I told God yes before I understood it because I met a person first. Yeah, absolutely. So I did. I wasn't doing anything to meet a person. I met the person first and I enjoy that person. So I agreed before I understood my calling. Now yes. I just get surprised on a regular basis by my calling. I'm like, yeah. oh, this is what I agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> totally. you know, in the natural, that's dangerous. Signing contracts without reading them. But if you're dealing with God, the contract's safe. <laughs> right. It's adoption, man. I mean, you got ado adopted into a kingdom, into a family. You got the family business just by blood. Yeah. You know? So... He, he is good to his word. It may not be how you expect it because he's constantly renewing your mind, but absolutely. That person, that's why I tell people, it the, the secret ingredients is the relationship with the one. That's the secret ingredient. You could, you could work at your life and, and succeed at everything you think in the worldly standards, and you'll still fail miserably because you miss the secret ingredient. You could do all the protocols and all the methodologies to spiritualism and succeed to some degree, and yet you'll still fail because you're missing the key ingredient. And that was the early early on. The father's like, you could do all these wonderful works for my name, but I want you to sit with me. Sit with me. Mm -hmm. Learn me. And not only will you be able to do those things, you'll do far many more. And greater things, because you chose the better part, which was to sit and learn of me, to learn me, right, and be taught by me. And even then, that was in the early 90s when he was, or late 90s when he was telling me that, and I still <laughs> didn't quite understand it. So if you do, if I do A, B, and C, you'll make me great. Like, yeah, 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 we'll get to that. But he <laughs> had to unwind that and realize, really, I just want to hang out with you. Like, I, this is my viewpoint. Uh, in my opinion, I think creation came into existence, not because uh, first and foremost, he just said, B, I think creation came out of relationship. I think it was a song and a dance that the Father, the Son, the Spirit did. Out of delight for one another, boom, creation happened. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm the, uh, big snapshot. Yeah. So I, I believe that creation all things that are created and continue to exist are out of relationship um, because that's what we're designed to do is to create out of relationship. When I mean, you think about just the simple structure of a man and wife being married, the intention of intimacy is to come together to be one. And in the oneness and in the act of intimacy of connection and relationship, something is created and reproduced. And that is just one simple analog of many, many different degrees of that principle being played out in creation to point us back to the original, which was the Son, the Father, the Spirit, doing their interaction. And, and out of the love play, they produced a creation that was beautiful and wonderful and a mystery. And then desiring to draw others you know, into that same love play and that, that love dance and to create, continue to create in relationship. So 
Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the perspective of a father-son, father-daughter, familial dynamic in the creator and his created ones. And the desire to have that relationship, I think, is, is not just scientific. It's not just some spiritual concept, you know, nebulous concept of a one. I think there's a, a deep interpersonal dynamic, purposeful relationship that's intended from day one that has is the secret ingredient to all the things we do and, and why we have our being and move in this earth. Yeah. So just continuing along those lines, uh, what does engaging God look like for you on a regular basis? Like, how do you pray? How do you meet with God? How do you fellowship with God? Um, even joining into that, um, what are some things that you would advise for people who are starting their relationship in order to get to really know God? Uh, you know, I said the first, I'll answer your first question. What do I normally do? So, uh, um, consistency habit, you know, every day setting up time. Like I have a, a seven o'clock alarm that goes off. Um, and I instantly at seven o'clock, well, and I'm I, as faithful as I can possibly at seven o'clock in the morning, I go into uh communion with my father, brother, Ruach Hagadesh. Uh, I call him Dodi, which is my beloved or my beloved uncle, whoever wants people have different viewpoints about what you know, male, feminine, female, whatever. And I'm going on a rabbit trail, but my family, Godhead, I sit with them on a regular basis and engage in a conversation with them you know i engage with the blood and the bread the blood and the body the bread and the, the drink which is eternal life which is my gateway my portal into sonship that's how i was adopted that is the power for a long life ever, everlasting life eternal characteristic life so i gauge that in a purpose way that's a everyday thing to remind me and to not just re just room not to remember because it's 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 a activity that engages a uh the whole being spirit soul and body like some people don't even take communion you know they just do it in the spirit which is cool you know do it in the spirit but i right now i still do physically elements because i want my physical body engaged in this bridging effect that's going on where heaven and earth are joined together in this being. And so there's a communion going on, and I want my body to engage on this side of the bridge with the process. And that became the, the beginnings is of a daily engagement. And I then I would go, when I would go sit with my father and my, and my family at the communion table, we, you know, I just simply went to be with them. I didn't bring questions. I didn't bring agendas. I didn't bring anything but the desire to sit with them. I didn't bring the Bible to read. I didn't bring prayer requests. I had put all that aside and said, I am simply here to seek you, to see your face. Like I'm having coffee with my dad across the table Whatever goes, goes. But the, pri the, the, the primary thing is I'm here for you, and you're here for me, and I'm going to just listen. I'm going to do the, the process of thanking Christ, coming with a grateful heart. We enter his courts with thanksgiving, with praise, right? And so I do that. In a grateful heart, I remember the elements I go through and just say, thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. But then we just sit. And I'd say, Father, what do you want to talk about? What, what is it that's on your heart for me? Or on for anybody, for that matter. And I would, uh, we just sit. And, and he would say something, and all of a sudden, phew, thousands of questions, right? Just start coming to my mind. And we would begin to unpack it. Other days, I would just sit there, and he would introduce somebody in the spirit. Someone would show up. Or other days, he'd say, let's go for a walk over here. And he'd pull back the fabric of time, space time, and we'd walk through into another a portal, into another dimension. And, and we'd experience and you know, unlock different things. And through the years, just begin to position myself to be in front, in, in his presence and him in my presence as a family. And then he began to open up his realms for me. Matter of fact, it became my plumb line. It still is today. I don't, I don't traipse off 
you know, and everybody's there. Everybody is a brother and sister. They've got their own process. Right. Um, and I leave them to theirs with the father. But my process and my plumb line is if I'm with you, I'm safe. So when I hit the crazy stuff, I'm not worried about getting out on, you know, the backside and Uranus or something like that, where I'm by myself. So my plumb line is the first touch basis with you. And then wherever we go from there, I'm, I'm good with because I'm going through my relationship. I'm engaging your realms, your kingdom through you, through that relationship. And then I go in the name and I have the safety net of my father because I'm going to step into things that are just out there, that are off my grid, that I don't understand. But because I trust you, because I'm putting the relationship first and foremost, I don't fear the mystery. And I think that's important um, for myself, at least, because you don't know what you don't know. And there are things that are dangerous out there. They aren't wicked and evil, but they're dangerous because you are immature. Not you, Nelson, but the audience where we're immature in our journey. And that's we're called to go out there. That's our it's part of our inheritance. The koshek, the, the obscurity, the mystery is actually the inheritance of the sons. So we are supposed to go out there. But if we do it apart from the relationship and we do it with presumption, we get ourselves into dangerous situations. He always is good to come in and help us. But I'd prefer to do it the other way around because it's, the, it's a delight. He wants to do it with us. And, and it delights my heart because I know I can do it in safety um, with that. And then he can feed me the wild mysteries as my system can handle it, right? Because we're all we're we're a system that balances chaos and order, right? Just like the makeup of father, our father, he breathed into the koshek, breathed into chaos, order, dark to light, right? So we're designed to do the same thing. We're designed to speak into it. And, and so our systems take on chaos and we can manage chaos to a certain degree. But when our chaos gets too much, our equilibrium of order and chaos is out of whack and our chaos is too much, that's where it gets dangerous. And so if you stay in the relationship, he can teach you how to manage the aperture, which allows in the chaotic, the koshek, the wild beasts that have eyes all around them, the things that are off the grid of description and yet are part of his realms, we can manage that aperture and know how much chaos we can manage until we assimilate the new, right? And it becomes part of the order we can open it up again. He, and I can do that in relationship better, far better than I can do by myself. And so I'm learning how to apprehend the, the mysteries of my father's realms by sitting in the relationship every day. And he unpacks that for me and the time he feeds me that stuff. And it's uh, it's allowed me to stay happy and excited about it and not freak out all the time, you know, and, and pull away for years because I saw something I shouldn't have because I was premature in my introduction to it. Um, the other huge component to that, massive, so I've got an analytical mind. So uh, reasoning is a big deal for me. Laws uh, being because I'm a firstborn, I have a, a nature tendency to to be exact. And if it's got to it's got to be true, otherwise I don't. Uh, the funny thing is, my last name is Demansky, which is son of. It's an Eastern Europe name, uh, which means son of Thomas. So there's a little bit of a Thomas doubt factor involved, right? I need to know that what I'm seeing is true, but it's also can be my my strength is also my weakness. So I had a hard time with unlocking and seeing in the spirit realm and apprehending the, 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 the other realms of my father because I was still stuck in a reasonable mindset. So he had to actually reintroduce me to um, childlike faith and reintroduce me to just casting myself upon him as a child. You said it's this way. You said anybody that would seek you. You would you would meet them. You would speak to them. So when I hear you speak, because I said I wanted to hear you, I have to believe, have the trust that this is you speaking. And if it's not you, then I'm going to have to trust that you save me from that voice 
and and reveal yourself to me in the proper way. I'm, I'm being a child again. I'm just going to keep take you at your word. And then I'm going to, if I got it wrong, then I'm going to trust that taking out your word, you're going to protect me. And that actually unlocked or removed a huge hindrance of analyzing, being logical about the process, second guessing uh, what I was seeing and experiencing. So a simple returning to simple childlike faith, just, yeah, this is, I'm going to believe that. And if I don't understand it, I'm not going to toss it out as just a bad, you know, last night's pizza. I'm going to tuck it away. That's a mystery. I'm going to hold it there and let you deal with it as the time comes. And, and there have been many times along the journey there are mysteries have come and I just don't get it. It seems like it goes against your scriptures, Father. And, and, and I let, but I, because of childlike faith, I just put it to the side. And a few months later, and it's happened so many times, boom, the revelation, the, the part, the missing component comes into play in the right time. And it's like, oh, this is what you were talking about. Now I get it because you have introduced the other part that makes the pieces come together. And that, <laughs> a lot of times those events have happened where I have literally fell out of my chair, just astonished. It's like somebody, like, you know, my companion angels just hit me over the head or something with a bat. Then I had a physical manifestation of this, this dawning, like, oh my God, where did that come from? And it's, it is like, you can't not say that it was from the father. It was so significant and so impactful in that moment. And, and those, because of the daily faithfulness of engaging in a childlike faith at the communion table, I positioned myself for becoming a recipient of the, the aha moments more often than ever before, you know, in my performance, religiosity of a, a good good son in the church, you know. Um, and it has revolutionized my moving, my breathing, and my living in the earth. So yeah. communion. And I mean, not just doing the elements, but I mean, communion daily, face to face, and then childlike faith, and then a yes and a heart are probably the, the three main components to the journey and, and the, the miraculous growth in relationship with my father. Cool. And there's two things that you touched on that I wanted to um, kind of go back to a little bit. Um Finding that safety in the relationship when you're exploring. That's some that's been my plumb line as well, is that God can be trusted. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm unsure, I can ask if I want an answer. Like I've been open. There are certain things I don't want an answer to because I'm enjoying the mystery. Right. Um, and I know I'll get an answer if I ask. Um things that are confusing, uh like or just the fact that sometimes God initiates conversations on their own. Uh, they can be trusted. <laughs> yeah. Where it's like, if God introduces a topic, you can trust God on that. What if it goes against the, the popular thing, the common thing? It's like, well, the common thing just has to be wrong. This isn't theology. I didn't teach this to myself. This is right. God sharing something. Uh, and then just talking about balancing the chaos and the order and things like that. I also agree with that, that there is a necessary balance where it's healthy, where too much order or too much chaos can be detrimental. Um, even if we're looking back into nature or just as human development outside of spirituality, you need somewhat of a balance of uh, conflict and peace. <laughs> In that right. you don't grow outside of that. If it's only conflict, you just it's just continuous death and destruction. There is no profit. Right. right. There's only injury. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if there's only rest and there is no conflict, there is no challenge. You're weak. You can't help anybody. You can't help yourself. Right. You don't grow. So there's this healthy in between, kind of like we see with like professional athletes, where they work hard and rest hard. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Where if they work out and they only train and they never leave, 
their body's going to fall apart and they won't be able to perform. Yeah. But absolutely. simultaneously, if they go out and they don't train at all, they just relax and relax and relax and relax and they go out to perform, they're, they're not going to perform. <laughs> right. So there's this healthy in between that we find in a lot of those areas of kind of mastering the chaos with the order, as you put it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So talk to us about your music. Okay. You mentioned that you were getting into, uh, I believe it's subliminal music. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so like I said, I've done music all my, my whole life. Um, and uh, did it, I, I kind of, you know, in the back of my mind, I always thought of music is one of those things as an industry where it's, it's enjoyable for the average person. They listen to music. And they give, you know, they'll buy some music when, when they have the finances for it. And so it's one of those industries where if things are tight, people, but not, you know, that one of the things that fall off the budget is I don't have time to buy music. I don't have time to buy artwork or I don't have the money for it. Right. I've got to buy food. So it was always a challenge to go into music full time. And um, even though that was the direction I'm supposed to go, um, figuring this out and then uh like i said this year we we stepped into a new concept with subliminal music now mind you i've known about subliminal messaging and and subliminal music for years and decades you know even growing up in the church it was one of those foreboding things don't get involved with those people you know kind of concepts and you just don't know what's coming down the pipe from their 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 voice and manipulating people right and and so i always kind of put it back there i didn't really think about it is part of what I would do. And um, someone had come to me. Well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, one of the things that journeys that father, the, the things that father has me journeying on right now and has been for a couple of years now is discovering his voice, understanding um, the living letters that frame up the creation that we live in, uh, the breath and, and what it sustains and understanding that his voice is, is uh, a limited spectrum, an unlimited spectrum of, of frequencies, right? And all, you know, physical science, uh, spiritual science, all the different things that deal with the voice, he's been journeying me on discovering and not just discovering his own voice and its makeup, but my own voice as a mimic, you might say, a, a image of his voice being resonated in my own being and so when i learn his voice and i shape my voice to his voice i become like god in the earth um, and i become like my older brother and so that discovery was sort of a or that journey was kind of parallel to just creating music and it was not correlated it didn't it wasn't i mean a music my voice singing i got it but i didn't really made the connection yet and then this past year in January uh, or March, I met, uh, hooked up with a friend I hadn't seen in a long time or heard of. Um, it was actually part of uh, another community that we'd met. And she reached out to me one day and she's like, hey, do you do subliminal music? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me look at it for a minute. You know, I jumped in, did a little quick little 15 minute research just to refresh my memory. And, and the light went on. Ding. Oh my gosh, I could totally do this. I could totally do and, and and father had set me up because as I was reading about it and studying it and, and getting an idea of really what subliminal messaging was doing, uh, it fell right into that grid work of the voice of my father and the power of the voice to create and to reshape and to terraform creation and to change and terraform the soul. And so um it fit right into what i was doing musically i can bring that into the music and so we've been my my friend and i we begin to journey in just discovering what is it to do you know how do we make this music i know it's got a bad reputation um and, it, and it's a whole culture out there if you do any deep dive into subliminal culture it's it's filled with a plethora of different spirits let's just put it that way and and voices and yet it is filled with 
hunger and desire. People are looking to it to change themselves spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And they're having success to some degree. They're seeing changes. They're experiencing uh, transformations in their as beings, as human beings. And it, it really opened my eyes that this is something that I can step into at the knowledge and capability. And I have an under, a working understanding of my father's voice, you know, is it's growing. So there's a, there's an authority as well, right? Not information is becoming ingrained into my being. I can begin to implement it in my own voice and use this as first and foremost, as a bridging or a tool to bring people into the relationship that I have or to have their own with the father in the similar way that I have one. And that's really been my desire. And anything I do, you know, as we moved in, as I moved into the sonship mindset, it was everything I do needs to facilitate others into the same. So with Sakula Studios, Subliminal Messaging, Loaded Music, which is the kind of the, the brand name for the Subliminal Messaging or music, I want to, and my goal is to leverage Subliminal Music in a way to draw them into relationship, into the voice that created them, that sustains them, that suspends them in animation and and continues to breathe them and, and, and cause them to draw to him into that communion, into that union. So I want to be that bridge. I want to use my music, use this, the messaging to draw people's hearts into that, that union again. And at the same time, have fun, you know, and, and create and use the creative inspiration that he has deposited me as a sovereign being. So uh, I, I don't claim to be the expert on simple messaging. Um, there's people that do it better, I'm sure, always is. But I'm branching into it with a different viewpoint than maybe most people do because I'm coming from it as a son with the intention of the voice changing someone drawing people into their real health their health drawing them into their real healing through the relationship sure you can do the sub the subs listen to it on a daily basis but you're still at the end of the day going to die unless you get into the relationship it's still not going to be forever it's a temporal fix it may give you some longevity it may provide a bit of relief but ultimately it's not going to sustain you long term indefinitely in eternal life that you get through the voice of your father who speaks over you and i want to, to connect the dots between the two so this is a kind of an onboarding tool that i i see the father using with uh, sugula studios and the subliminal messaging that's cool so um one last question i ask people this every now and then who have been some people throughout history, whether it be modern or not, um, that you consider some of your inspirations? That's a good question. History lessons. <laughs> um, okay, I would say um, Smith Wigglesworth uh, was probably one of the big guys um, because of his passion to to really lean in the word to to take the word for what it was become his passion and i mean the, the the legend is i think it's still i think it's a truth i don't know I, what i read understood from people who his biographies is that he wouldn't read anything but the bible uh, now i'm not like that i do read other things no uh, but i spend a lot of time in the word because it is the manna of life and so uh, I read it and I sit with my father in it, but that inspiration of taking father's word, I mean, even the fact they said he wouldn't allow any knife to cut him, you know, while he was alive, that everything that was done physically that was working on his body, he was going to trust in the the man of the bread of life, the source, the word of his father to be the one that brings the change of healing to deliver him if necessary. So that was one of the big big ones um that have stuck with me um let's see 
who else would I would think of I'm trying to it's a good question. I haven't thought about it in a long time. So thanks, Nelson, for putting me on the spot with this one. <laughs> um, I, I guess modern person living today, uh, I have to give credit to Ian Clayton for my journey because he helped bridge the gap to a lot of the things I'm walking in right now. And um, although I don't lean heavily on his teachings right now and, and, eating at that table um, on a regular basis. I, it's definitely, he's been a, a definite influence in that process. And I know I couldn't have been here without having first entered into his house for a season and sat at his table. And, and still, I still appreciate him. And I still appreciate what he does. Um, but he's yeah. unlocked the big, the big questions, the freedom things that helped me, get out of the box and give me language really and a stepping a stepping stone open the door i think that's the big part you know is opening the door to step into the realms and giving me the tools to, to begin that journey for myself it was one of the biggest influences in in the current grid work that i'm in yeah and yeah. uh just kind of breaking the fourth wall a bit but uh for those of you who don't know, that's where Jeff and I met, was working in Ian's ministry for some time, worked there for a few years. Yeah, it was good. It was a good connection. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is there anybody else? Oh, man, there's, uh, I guess, uh, some of the big, you know, the cool thing about stepping in, right, is you get to, you get to meet a lot of people that don't walk on the earth right now, and that's that's huge right you yeah. know sitting with moshe or sitting uh meeting some of the big guys samson surprised me um you know and and going into the in the father's table and, and be able to be introduced um that i think just sitting in the cloud of witnesses and there's just so many yeah. to pick from they all have played from elisha to ezekiel to nathaniel have all been integral um, to who I am. Yeah, and I, I can agree with that. Yeah, Like you mentioned someone that people don't usually bring up when they talk about the cloud, and that's Samson. Like, that's part of my story is Samson is the one who taught me to pray in the first place. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I definitely agree that fellowshipping regularly with the cloud of witnesses gives you access to things that you won't read anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and that that's the, the beauty is that you, you sit. So you can, you can read people's lives, right? You write, you read autobiographies and you read about their lives, but you get parts and pieces of it and you get the imperfections of it. But when you sit, in, in the other side of the realm, the, the veil, and you sit with those who have gone before you. And they sit in perfection. Now, you may not receive the, the, the full picture, but everything that you do receive is in perfection. And so there's still mystery, but the, the component is that these, these ones have a delight in you, right? And they desire to sit in your at your table they sit with you and they may have a mandate over your life to speak into it they may be a a one-off invitation to, to sit with them but they desire to sit and you know that you could really receive the full love and perfection without any uh below the sun filters that have to you know that we still get in even the language of english where we get the corruptive influences that are still the frequencies you sit in that in perfection and you can feel, I mean, it's, it's rather amazing, honestly, to be sitting across the table from one that has been in the father's presence, the ones that you read about in scripture and they, there's no, there's no guile. There's no uh, lording over. There's no criticism. There's full acceptance, full of the intensity of acceptance is, is 
disarming and very humbling. And I'm like, who are you to be sitting with me? Like, or who am I that I'm sitting with you? And you want to talk to me? <laughs> what a little old me? And yet you don't get any of that from them. They're the perfect yeah. tutors and guides, perfect uh, trainers, because they don't have corruptive agendas involved, you know, involved with their own kingdoms and building up their own mountains that you deal with on the, the lower end of the sun, you know, walking into the earth that perfectly or imperfectly people try to, that are, are melded into the, who they are in the earth that they're working themselves out, you know, working out their junk. You don't have any junk to deal with, with those tutors. And that, I think that's phenomenal. That's. Yeah. Like, I um, wouldn't give it up <laughs> because I don't go to traditional church or, even really classify myself as a Christian, people often come to the assumption that people like me or even just me uh, kind of just do what we want. <laughs> right. But when you live a life surrendered to the spirit in the way that we really are, we don't get away with anything. In fact, yeah. we'd get away with more if we were submitted under church leadership. Right. It's like, Absolutely. it's hard to get it. Not, not saying you even want to, but like, it's hard when your mentors can just pop up when they feel like it, you can't really be sneaky. They're always watching. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It's a, uh, you want to talk being held accountable, you know? Yeah. It's a, the, <laughs> the most beautiful, perfective way to be held accountable because they're always there. And, uh, they don't, there's nothing that they don't see, you know, it's, it's pretty wild. It's good. Yeah. And then just thinking about how effective they are as teachers, like uh, Enoch told me something in 2020 that I've still been thinking about for the last three, almost four years, <laughs> just because it, he covered a lot in one sentence, right? Just in one little one little message he covered a bunch of topics and it applies in so many areas i'm like wow <laughs> yeah they don't have to say much do they it's like takes forever to unpack some things how many times yeah. i'm sure it's happened to you they've shared things that seem like again off the grid of what i understand this to mean quoting a passage and you're like that's not how i remember that going yeah and like talk about speaking with that imperial kingdom voice that ever expanding voice it's like well they speak one word and you think about it for three years and it continues right. to unpack itself <laughs> yeah absolutely Which i believe it's a technology we've yet to master right that Light some language. of us do it on accident because there's people who might linger on some of our words for some time but every conversation you have with them anyone from that realm really it stays and yeah. it continues to unpack and it continue. It's like one of those zip files that you send. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have this where, joke too with the father, like a couple times, yeah. you know, where he, I'll sit with somebody and I'm like, man, what time is it? Because they've been talking a long time and I, and not that I don't want to, I, I want to stay there forever, but I know when I finish up, I'm going to have to go write this out. And I'm like, dang, this is going to take three hours just to write out. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, i don't want to it's too much information <laughs> but that's uh the light language you're talking about right they they communicate so much more you know that the phrase that a picture is a thousand words is, is that begins to scratch the surface of that reality of uh, i'm going to be unpacking this for quite some time in just your one sentence and yeah um that's part of our maturing and growing up yeah. And that kind of goes into why I was asking you about people you consider inspirations is because typically who you're gleaming from reflects in you. So if you're regularly fellowshipping with people who right. speak in such a way that their words carry that much weight, you're indirectly learning that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, learning and I to have be that, that type of teacher. Yeah. And, and I have intentionally. So for Segula Studios, not just Segula Studios, because that falls under the house of Segula. That's my that's the name the father gave me is Segula. So this is what I'm what I'm walking out. But he gave me mentors. So I have a, a bench for the house of Segula that I sit with on a weekly basis. And they are 
the ones that have given influence or ability to speak into, you know, as the father hovers over the table and the pre his presence, they are there to help unpack Segula and unpack who I am in the earth. Um, you know, so they're advisors and counselors, but they're more than that because they're um, they're family members and mixture of beings that uh, that sit on that table and they become my the greatest influencers of who I am. And I, I wouldn't train it for the world. And it's been going on for about a couple of years now with this bench as different ones, keen ones were inter introduced to me. Because one of the things that was frustrating with me early on too was I was in, it was engaging with all these different ones in in father's realms as he would introduce them. And it would be like months before I get back to it, if ever. And I was getting frustrated because we're, it's all about relationship in him. So a one-time meeting is enough to build relationship with, but how do I get connected with them again? And then I'm going to go to so-and-so's house and then so, you know, I meet up with somebody else. And it's, it was just, it was getting frustrating. Really, it was a good frustration, but it was a frustration of just being able to tap into such a resource. And I think that was out of God's, out of the Father's uh, kindness that he uh, helped me establish the bench to be a little more laser focused, you might say, with uh, with the relationships that I was building. Um, not diminishing the other ones, but just keying in on the ones that were the most influential and purposeful for this season of my my journey mm -hmm. in establishing the house of Stigula and discovering what its meant and purpose was for being in the earth, being in creation. And that's really been integral with the past few years, especially uh, in helping identify a sonship, my identity, helping me to step into uh, what it means to be a son, what it means to be Sugula in the earth, hoping to, to struggle or to, to wrestle with the different challenges of things that I would, I would see out in the mystery. And I was able to come back to the table and under the guidance of these ones, these, my companions, my friends began to unpack it and get some revelation. Matter of fact, you know, being analytical, I'd often take stuff that I would see in the mysteries and I'd go and come out and I'd go online and I'd start looking for things and I'd go on the internet and I'd try to figure out what was going on. What did I see? How do I describe it? How does this work? Does it work in science? Does it work in math? All these little things. And in the process of doing that, I've relearned how I take the mysteries because I sat at the table and I sat with these, this is my bench. And I did it in relationship first. So I'd get the mysteries. I'd bring it back to the table. We would unpack it in relationship. And, and the mysteries would then take on some more. But it would begin to formulate ideas. So they would help me get my head wrapped around it, so to speak. And then after I did that, I would then go to the earthly references. And I would see, see what I had seen in a, in a new light. And the, the revelation I was able then to be able to apply to the science or the math and make sense of what I was seeing in the natural was first funneled through the relationships. So now these ones are not just, uh, or what I was seeing wasn't just a, a mental ascension and understanding information. I was now gaining insight and revelation via relationship first. And then that actually impact a depth the length and height and width that I couldn't have done on my own by just doing some internet research or using the, the tools at hand. Um, it, it helped me position my viewpoint, you might say, in the right angle, the right facet, to then view that information, that revelation, through the lens of relationship. And it, it unlocked and um, gave me a new way of uh, educating myself in the Father's uh, service or father's what is word i'm thinking of tutelage through these he has set up around me and uh it's been phenomenal and i've been able to unlock it for myself but then turn around and teach my boys the process as well um, yeah and free them from you know early age from before the the age-old dogmas of how you learn and the education systems get into their you know their yeah. normal thinking Get ahead of that beforehand and it's been really been good for us as a family that's great 
So we're getting ready to close. Um, where can people connect with you in your ministry? Yeah, um, you can um, reach out to me directly at jeff at sukulustudios.com. Uh, my website is sukulustudios.com. And we also have a Facebook page and uh, I'm on Instagram, tel uh, Telegram, and on uh, Twitter. So those all, you look up uh, Sukulu Studios, you should be able to find me on those platforms. Um, and yeah, you can join me. Just, uh, the website's probably the most informative. You can sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, we do have a free track still called Cherish. It's our kind of our debut subliminal track. Um, it's free. You can go and sign up for um, for it and get it downloaded for free to uh, try it out. And uh, it's a way for me to get feedback from the listeners on how they're being impacted by it. And you can find all again all that on uh, sagulastudios.com. That's great. Um, and let's see. Could you pray for the audience before we close out? Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to just reach out to your uh, image bearers who speak and, and do my part to resonate your voice um, into the lives of those who are already resonating your voice and to be able to speak into those things and bring forth the destiny in them to spark a vibration that would ignite an earthquake in their beings, that would ignite a fire that would set them ab ablaze like never before, that they might come uh, alive and illuminate as an illuminated one as you designed them to be, that they might come into union, that cherished union with Yeshua HaMashiach, with you, Yahweh, with you, Father, that they would become one with you as their ultimate design and purpose. And they might enter into a relationship that will blow their mind and expand their horizons and dig their wells deeper than ever before to free them from the things that if it inhibited them, fear and unbelief and concern and worry about tomorrow, that you have made a way in your son for us to enter into a shalom, a Shabbat shalom that is everlasting and eternal. We thank you that you have made a way into a family of eternity that will never be broken, will never be separated, but will always be drawn into unity and into creation forever. We thank you for that. And we honor your name above all names. To be glorified, let your word run swiftly in these. May they be expanded, their minds be expanded into new territory. Break down the boxes, break down the four walls. Unpeel, re-engineer, reshape them, reform them, transform them into the redeemed mind of Christ, that they might become like the others that are also walking in the same, that join the company of sons in the earth to join together to restore what you have intended, that we might answer the cry of sons together as one, as one community, to bring about your purposes and plans, your desires in this, this time and this era for us. As such a time as this, we are all designed to be part of that. So I thank you for the opportunity to, to voice that, to resonate that. Thank you, Father. Awesome. Thank you for joining me here today. It's been an honor to have you on. Let's see. And uh, this concludes this episode of The Inner. Please check out Jeff uh, and Sagula Studios, um, as well as leave in the comments down below anyone else that you would love for me to have on the show. Um, and be sure to check out the description and the rest of the channel. That being said, I'll see y'all next time.